Last week I talked about God's message to Philadelphia. Today I'd like to talk about God's message to Laodicea. Now, as I did last week, I quoted extensively from our free booklet, Is That in the Bible? The Mysteries of the Book of Revelation. And I'd like to do the same now, this time talking about Laodicea. But I will have a lot of additional comments to make as we go through this Bible study. Let me just see what the time is. Okay. So we say in our booklet the following. Laodicea was a very prosperous city near Colossae. Christ alluded to this prosperity, also by referring to fine wool and isolf, two of the town's commercial products. The city was a banking center as well, and its water supply was channeled from hot springs some distance away, essentially reaching the town in a lukewarm state. Christ said in Revelation 3 that he wished the Laodiceans were either cold or hot, but that he will spew them out of his mouth because they were lukewarm. Strauss, which is a preacher which we have quoted throughout the booklet because he wrote a very interesting book on the book of Revelation, he says the following. This the Lord is saying to those at Laodicea that if, instead of being lukewarm, they were so cold as to feel the bitterness and severity of that coldness. They would flee to the true warmth of refuge. If we are really cold and admit to that fact, our confession will lead to the removal of our sin. The Greek word for hot means boiling hot. The members in the church at Laodicea were not boiling hot. They were not ardent Christians. They had no enthusiasm, no emotion, no zeal, no urgency. It is possible to have a large measure of doctrinal correctness. I like to repeat this. It is possible to have a large measure of doctrinal correctness without the fire of spiritual fervor and affection. Let me go on to say in our booklet, it should be noted here that while all the other messages were directed to the angel, either a spirit being or a human leader, of a particular city, this message is directed to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, not Laodicea. It's directed to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, showing perhaps the individuality, quote unquote, of the people. Halley's Bible Handbook remarks, strange picture. A church of Christ, with Christ himself on the outside, asking to be let in to one of his own churches. A strange picture indeed. Erdmann's Handbook to the Bible concurs, stating, the worst case of all seven is a church so satisfied as to be totally blind to its, to its true condition. It is so far from what it should be that Jesus stands outside knocking for admittance to the lives of individuals who call themselves Christians. We believe, we go on to say, that we are living today in the last era of the church, the Laodicea era. Therefore, the message to the Laodiceans should serve as a strong warning for us today. Rather than keeping the doors of our hearts closed, we are to obey his command and zealously embrace his promise to his true followers, as recorded in John 14, verse 23, and I quote it, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Anyone who does not do so is essentially refusing to follow Christ by refusing to do what he says, thus denying entrance to him who stands outside knocking. The last era, that of the Laodiceans, will be predominantly in existence at the time of Christ's return. But this doesn't mean that those who are called today could not become a part of the remnant of the Philadelphia era. 
Laodiceans are not limited to any one particular church organization. They actually can be found in every true organization of the body of Christ. Regardless of their corporate affiliation, and regardless of what church era one may actually belong to individually, all in God's church must remain or must become zealous, and they must repent. They must maintain or acquire the Philadelphia spirit in order to be accounted worthy of escaping the terrible times ahead and to stand before the Son of God when he returns. And of course, we're making reference to Luke 21 to 36, which I believe, if I have time, we'll get into today as well, a little bit later. History reveals, we conclude, as does God's infallible word, that Jesus did indeed build his church, that commencing with the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts 2, God separated individuals whom he called and to whom he gave his Holy Spirit, that throughout some 2,000 years of subsequent history, the church of God has existed, even though its identity has been often overshadowed by false churches. And that even now, in a time when Satan has caused a scattering of God's people, Jesus Christ still works and rules as the living head of the church of God. Now earlier, when we had talked about the Philadelphia era, we made the following comment, and I quoted it last time. I'd like to quote it again in this context. The sixth era of Philadelphia began under Herbert Armstrong, who had come into contact with the Sardis era in 1927 and was ordained as a minister in 1931. The Philadelphia era began in 1933. At the time of his death in 1986, Mr. Armstrong wandered in a prayer in the presence of the Advisory Council of Elders, whether he was passing the baton to the Laodicea era. Subsequent events have answered this question in the affirmative. But since Christ promises a Philadelphian protection from the still future event of the Great Tribulation, remnants of the Philadelphia era must still exist and be active at the time of Christ's return. And with these introductory comments, I'd like to go now to Revelation chapter 3. And let's go again through the different verses here and analyze them and notice exactly what is being said. Revelation 3 and verse 14. And here I'm reading from the New King James Bible, mainly. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, notice, write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation. Now, this is an interesting phrase. And some claim, preach, state that Christ had a beginning. That there was a time when Christ didn't exist. When the apostasy in the world by Church of God under Mr. Armstrong's death started, it was actually stated that Christ didn't even exist prior to his becoming a human being. Others are saying, no, he did exist prior to that. He was an angel. Others say, no, he did exist prior to that, not as an angel, as a God being, but he was created by God the Father. So all these different versions have one thing in common. Christ had a beginning. But the Bible tells you that Christ did not have a beginning. The Bible tells you that Christ always existed. There was never a time when he didn't exist together with God the Father. You might want to turn with me to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. 
Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old from everlasting. Now, in Hebrew, chapter 7, it becomes even clearer. Hebrews chapter 7, and let's start reading in verse 1. And here's another mystery for many, many people when they read that, and they read about a person with the name of Melchizedek. Well, everybody has their own ideas as to who that Melchizedek was. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, a short form for Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God. So you have in the God family one who is the Most High God, that's the Father. But then you have the other being in the God family, and that's Jesus Christ, the Son. Now here this Melchizedek is called the priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part, a tithe, of all. Now, how did Abraham know that? If the tithing law was not in force and effect, only became effective at the time of Moses. So he gave him a tenth part of all. This Melchizedek is called King of Righteousness. King of Righteousness. And then also King of Salem, meaning King of Peace. Now, who is a King of Righteousness? Who is a King of Jerusalem? Who is a king of peace? It goes on to say in verse 3, for those who still doubt, mm -hmm. this Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. The word like can also mean equal with or identical. He remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, in whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Let's drop down to verse 8. Here mortal men, talking about the Levites, receive tithes. But there he receives them, this Melchizedek, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. There's only one being, one human being, who died and who lives again, and that is Jesus Christ. Since Melchizedek is alive today, because everybody else died, Abraham died, Moses died, it has to be Jesus Christ. And of course, that's exactly what this scripture tells you. He is without beginning, he has no beginning. And when you turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, that's what Christ is saying of himself. Revelation 22 and verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Again, here he's called the beginning and the end. Now, if you say that Christ had a beginning, then Christ would also have to have an end, which is, of course, totally illogical to assume that. But let's go a step further and go to the book of John, chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1. In the beginning, here we have that again, in the beginning, was the word, the logos, the spokesman. And the word, the Logos, was with God, the Most High, the Father. And then it goes on to say, and the word was God. Talking about the Son, because it says later that he became flesh. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, and all things were made through him. All things. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In the Greek, when it says, in the beginning was the word, 
The meaning is, and many commentaries point that out, whatever you look at the beginning, Christ was already there because he had no beginning. He has always existed. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, let's look at that passage. Now, why, why am I spending that much time on this aspect? Well, I'll tell you in a moment. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. He made everything through Jesus Christ. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, Chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. In verse 8, Paul is saying, I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ and God the Father are the God family, if you please. And we are begotten children of the God family if we have received God's Holy Spirit. Christ never had a beginning. Whatever there was, insofar as a beginning is concerned, Christ was already there because he has always lived. It is God the Father who created everything through Christ, so Christ is the beginning in the sense of creation because he created everything. Or a better translation would be he is the beginner of creation. He is the one, the author of everything there is. Now the German Schlachter Bible commentary makes an interesting statement here. They say there was a false teaching which was very much adhered to in Laodicea that Christ was a created being. But they go on to say, but in reality, he is the author, the originator of creation. But I thought this was interesting, that especially in Laodicea, this wrong teaching was prevailing as it is today in our Laodicean era. And the warning is very clear. Don't fall for it. Do not believe it. Now, some may say, yeah, but how can this be that you have a father and a son, the one is subject to the other? We are not being told that. The Bible doesn't reveal how it can be. The Bible reveals that it is so. As the Bible reveals that God has always existed. There was never a time when God didn't exist. You know, some say, oh, I can't understand that it is a father, but how could it be two God beings? Well, you cannot understand that it's a father either. How can you understand with your human limited mind that God has always existed. It's based on revelation that we can understand. It's based on faith that we accept that truth. And so now he goes on to say he is the beginner of the creation of God. Verse 15, I know your works. But he wasn't impressed because the works were neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. We just read about this. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Those people will cease, if that happens, to be members of the body of Christ. Now, I read on purpose the comments by Strauss earlier, because some are saying, oh, Christ wants them to be cold or hot. In other words, cold, that's refreshing when you have a heat situation, and of course hot, that's good if you're freezing. No, that's not what he's talking about. He was talking about the fact, as we pointed out, he wanted them to be cold so that they can understand their miserable condition and do something about it. And he says, but you're lukewarm, so you're fine with what you are doing, so you think, and so therefore they are 
following a wrong concept. Because if you go on to say in verse seven, uh, to read in verse 17 what he says, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You say, I am rich. They have a false self-evaluation of themselves. If you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. Here Paul sarcastically is talking to the Corinthians. Well, let's start with verse 7, because I believe that's an interesting introduction to this. He says, For who makes you different from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you do, did indeed receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? See, oh, I am rich because of my own strength. Verse 8, You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Talking about now the millennium. But see, they thought, oh, they are already rich. They are already full. They are already reigning. <laughs> and Paul is saying, no, you are completely, totally deceiving yourselves. In James chapter 1, James is picking up the same topic. James chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if someone is a hearer of the word, the Laodiceans are hearers of the word, but he is not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he himself observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. There might be some fleeting moments when somebody may recognize how he or she really is, but that's passing. And then, oh, we are coming back to this self-confidence, this self-evaluation of, oh, we are fine. When you go with me to a parallel in the book of Matthew, very famous one, chapter 25. Notice how it starts in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lambs and took no oil with them. Lamp is always, or many times, identified as the word of God. So they had God's word, but they took no oil with them. Oil being representative of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels and their lamps. Verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered and slept. But then at midnight, verse 6, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out and meet him. At midnight, when it's the darkest time of the day, a call is heard by the church. Go out, get ready, meet him, he's coming. And of course we know the story, five were able to do that, they still had enough oil, the other five didn't have enough oil. The point is, everybody in the church fell asleep. Everybody had to be awakened. If you go with me to the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3, and at verse 2. Habakkuk 3 and verse 2. O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. 
This work will have a lot to do with pronouncing what's coming. The great tribulation, the wrath of God, the day of the Lord, the seven last plagues. When is this going to happen? The parallel is explained in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, so it were told you. Now, Paul would later quote this scripture insofar as the preaching of the gospel is concerned. But here another aspect is emphasized in verse 6. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. The modern Chaldeans, you could call them the last revival of the ancient Roman Empire. Those ten nations or groups of nations in Europe coming together, those core nations, giving their power, their authority to a charismatic political military leader called the Beast. These things are parallel. Around this time, or up until this time, when God is raising the Chaldeans, God's church is still proclaiming a very short work. Very short. So short, so quick but also so powerful, God says you would be surprised if you would have been told that. So let's go back to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and pick up one more thing here. Because he also had said, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Naked. They are not clothed with anything. They are not clothed with righteousness, necessarily, but they are not clothed with wrong clothing either. They're just naked. But the point is, they are not clothed with the wedding garment. And unless they put that one on, they're not going to be participating in the marriage supper. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, he goes on to say, oh, let's start with verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. In other words, you said, I'm rich, but you're not. But if you buy from me gold refined in the fire, then you can become rich, spiritually speaking. And also, he says, I counsel you to also get white garments that you may be closed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see, because they're not seeing. They're blind. They think they see. And so Christ is saying, get something, do something in your life so that you are going to be able to see. We all have to be those compared with gold to be refined in the fire. That is true for everyone for every question. But these people in particular have a great need to go through that fiery trial, if you please. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. Again, starting with verse 6 to see the context. Peter is saying, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, we'll talk about faith in a moment, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. So that that genuineness of your faith may be found to praise, honor, and glory at when? The revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns. That's the end goal. That's what Christ wants us to understand. Even if we go through trials now, it is for the fact that we are going to be in God's kingdom if we respond. He goes on to say, it's not done yet, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. Revelation 3 and verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Therefore, he says, be zealous and repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. First, go to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. And this explains what Christ was saying here insofar as those whom I love, I chasten. Hebrews 12 and verse 4. You have not resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. Now we are approaching the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. We are called upon to examine ourselves, to understand where we are, that we don't have a false self-hope and self-determination, self-evaluation. And when we see sin in our lives, we have to get rid of it. And sometimes it's painful. And so Paul is saying here, you haven't yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And he scourges every son whom he receives. And if you are enduring chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father doesn't chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, might not have always been best in God's eyes, but he is doing it for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. See, we are supposed to become glorified, holy, immortal God beings in his family. He's saying here, we just read that, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Now, if you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And let's go to verse 31. We talked about this process of examining ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. He's warning us not to take the Passover in an unworthy manner. And then he says in verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, because we don't really judge ourselves as much as we should, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. God will show us sometimes so the hard knocks of life, where we have to improve, where we have to change. And sometimes that is difficult to accept. Also go with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And verse 14, it's talking about verse 13, interestingly enough, the way that's worded, we're talking about our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior, who gave himself, verse 14, for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. What did we read in verse 19 of Revelation 3? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. It has a lot to do with being zealous for good works. For doing, not just for listening, not just for hearing. Also in Galatians chapter 4, I hope, because my notes here are very small and 
I hope that I'm reading this correctly. Yes, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, but it is good to be zealous in a good thing, always. And not only when I am present with you. Always be zealous for things which are good, not which are bad. We find out in the Bible that many times Paul is talking about the Israelites, the fleshly carnal Israelites. He said, well, you are zealous, but not with understanding. That was a kind of wrong zeal. That's not what we're talking about. But here we are being told to be zealous. And as we have just read, that would also show being zealous in good works. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. I stand at the door. Now that tells you the timing. It's the very last days, the end time when Christ is ready to return. And he gives a last warning here, saying, please open the door. Let me in. He's knocking. He's asking the Laodiceans to repent, to wake up, to let Christ live his life in them. And then he says, and when that happens, then I will come and you will dine with me. Now, in Luke chapter 12, there is another marvelous passage which sheds a few more lights on this statement, what Christ actually will do. And we are talking about the marriage supper, which is going to be here on earth. Couldn't possibly be in heaven. It would make no sense if you look at all the different parables and scriptures. But in Luke chapter 12 and in verse 35, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for the master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Christ is knocking now. Are we opening to him immediately? Or do we still have reservations? Wanting to do it our way. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. What a remarkable picture. Here is Christ, the great God, the Savior. He's going to come to serve us as this passage is written. That's what Christ is offering. He's offering it to the Laodiceans. The question is, are they going to listen? Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. He says, to him who overcomes, who is victorious, I will grant, better, I will give, to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Well, first, the interesting statement, the one who overcomes, Christ will give them to sit with him on his throne. Notice Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Revelation 22 and verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly. I am coming soon, very soon. He's standing at the door knocking. I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now at this point, Christ is not impressed of the works of the Laodiceans, but he is asking them to repent and to do the works which are good, be zealous for those good works. And he says, and then I will give you the opportunity to sit with me on my throne, which is going to be here on this earth, because Christ is going to rule from this earth, sitting on the throne of David, which then will be in Jerusalem. He says, I will grant this to you, 
if I have, as I have overcame, overcome, in other words, he overcame as well. He was victorious. And I have sat down with my father on his throne in heaven. And that's why we are saying that Christ is sitting on the throne in heaven next to the father. Now, that doesn't mean he's always sitting there, and it doesn't mean they always sit there on the throne, but that's the concept. They're ruling in heaven from heaven. And nothing what is happening here on this earth, actually, is something which God doesn't know anything about, or which God doesn't allow to happen. Now, we have pointed out that there were seven church eras, starting with the foundation of the church all the way until the time of Christ's return. So there were seven eras of the New Testament church. But did you know that you can also look at seven eras of the, if you please, Old Testament church? The congregation in the wilderness, as it is sometimes called. Let's quickly go through those. The first one, of course, was the era of Ephesus in the New Testament. It would have been the foundation, the founding of the church and the state together under Moses and Joshua. The second era, Smyrna, would, could be compared with the era of the judges. The third era, Pergamon, would refer to the combined rule, kingship, under Saul, Saul, David, and Solomon. The fourth era, Theatira, would be parallel to a divided kingdom, which, by the way, ended in captivity. The next era, Sardis, would refer to Jewish governors, such as Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, in the Persian Empire, but the people, as you know, weren't quite anxious to respond when the temple was supposed to be built. It took a long, long time for them to get hot. The sixth era, or era, would have been Philadelphia in the New Testament. It would be referring to the zeal from that standpoint. We're talking about necessarily, not necessarily converted people, but it would be the zeal of the Maccabees when they were bringing rule back to the Jews under the occupation of the Romans and others. And now we have the seventh era, which would be the Laodicean era, the Laodicean period. Notice what Christ is talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 23. And this gives you a little bit of a hint what else the Laodiceans have to deal with, have to watch carefully. Matthew 23 and verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, nobody excluded, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The Laodiceans are still part of God's church. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. The idea is, to an extent, the right teaching was proclaimed still by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. Of course, they had added all kinds of traditions with it. But Christ said, overall, they teach you what's right, but they don't live by it. And you don't follow that bad example. The Laodicean era is mainly happening, or will culminate in, let's put it this way, the time of the Great Tribulation, the time of the place of safety, the time of the day of the Lord, and the time of the return of Jesus Christ. And many belonging to the Laodiceans will have to go through the Great Tribulation so that their faith can be refined and purified as gold, tested in the fire. Notice Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, we are dealing with 144,000 out of the 
tribes of Israel, but I'd like to focus now on the great multitude, consisting of all nations and tribes. And in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 13, here's what John is seeing in a vision. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? This great multitude. And where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. And so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. So they had to go in the great tribulation, had to go through it, at least to an extent. They came out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white, see? No longer were they unclothed, they made them white, they had robes, and they did so in the blood of the lamb. In other words, they accepted the sacrifice. They worked on their lives and they did away, conquered their sin, and they received forgiveness when they repented. And of course, it says in verse 15, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them, future tense. And verse 17, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them, future tense. So this is not talking about already that the time, talking about the time when Christ has already returned, and most certainly doesn't talk, talk about an idea that they would be up there in heaven. You know, this is not what it's talking about. These are people who have repented. They are appearing before the throne of God daily, like you and I do, when we pray. But the point is they came out of the great tribulation. They had to go into it first. In Revelation chapter 12, in verse 17, first this talks about a group of people who are going to be at the place of safety, going to be protected from the great tribulation. But then in verse 17, it says the dragon, Satan the devil, he was enraged with a woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, several points we have to understand here because people are saying, yeah, why is that? I mean, you know, they, they keep the commandments. They, they have the testimony. So why would they have to go through the great tribulation. How come they are not being at the place of safety? Well, first of all, when it says a dragon made war with them, a better translation, as many have it, he made war against them. He made war, the dragon made war against them. He's trying to destroy them, sending these spiritual arrows. They keep the commandments of God, it says. In other words, they know about them. What it doesn't say is that they are doing them. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and in verse 6. This is what was told to the ancient Israelites. He says, therefore, be careful to observe them, the judgments, the statutes, the laws. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Well, here it says, therefore, be careful to observe them. The authorized version has it much more clearly. Therefore, keep and do them not only keeping them in the sense you have them, but do them. That's what's lacking when it comes to the Laodiceans. In chapter 28, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 13. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 13, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them. Again, the authorized version has it better. Which I command you today to observe and do them. 
or to keep and do them, as other translations have it. So it's not enough to just have them. As we read earlier, the Laodiceans might have a lot of right doctrines, but they don't show that they are zealous for his word by doing it, by keeping it. The German Elberfelder Bibel has it exactly that way. Keep and do them. And then it also says they have the testimony of Jesus. But again, something is lacking. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2, notice what it says here. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. Did you notice what was missing? Who bore witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not just having the testimony of Jesus, but to bear witness. In other words, you live as a living example by keeping it. That is exactly what here the Laodiceans don't do, didn't do. And that's why God found them not worthy enough to be protected. We should understand that all of this is happening at the time when the beast power arises in Europe. In Revelation chapter 13, because it goes right on here after we read about the place of safety and those who are not going to be at it. In Revelation 13, it talks about the beast. And it says in verse 8, And he who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. They will worship him. In the Greek, it is a masculine term which is used. It's not talking about the beast as a government, as a power, because then it would have had to say it in the Greek. It doesn't. It says him. And this is talking about a man. And so people will walk after him, will worship him, will believe that he is doing a great work for them, I'm amazed when I see what's happening in Europe right now, particularly in Europe, regarding the measures of the coronavirus and how the German government and one particular person is becoming more and more instrumental. And people like what's happening. I mean, autocratic measures are being liked. What if you have a really autocratic government in Europe forbidding you to keep the Sabbath, forbidding you to keep God's holy days, enforcing your worshiping the beast, the false prophet, on Sunday, on Christmas, Easter? The whole world will follow him, will worship him. In a sense, what we are seeing right now is a preview, a small preview perhaps, but a preview of what we can expect to happen very soon in a much broader scale. Verse 14, and he deceives those. Now this is talking about another beast, the false prophet, and the organization which the false prophet is leading. He deceived those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who, not which, in the Greek, who, who was wounded by the sword and lived. In other words, this person will also be wounded, will probably have a political defeat. People will think, oh, well, he's gone, like Adolf Hitler, when he had this Bierhallen putsch and then was put to jail. Nobody thought he would ever come back. Why did he come back? But you see, he is the one who is also being worshipped by the people, and he was wounded by the sword. In other words, having this political defeat. But he will come back. 
it's a masculine term here, so it's talking about a masculine person, not a woman, a man. And he's also referred to as King Assyria of, or King, the new King of Assyria, let's say, or King Jarab of Assyria. Jarab means the one who is fighting. Assyria, modern Germany, modern Austria. This is where you got to look. Many people today, Laodiceans, look at all the wrong places because they don't understand prophecy. Christ says, I've given you, I would say the Philadelphia remnant, the spirit of prophecy. If he doesn't give it to us, we wouldn't understand. In Revelation, we just read that, that here is a masculine person, but there is more to be said about him in Daniel 11, but keep your finger here in the book of Revelation, we'll come right back to it. But in Daniel 11, there's another interesting passage, another characteristic, if you please, of that beast power, and that beast in particular. Daniel 11 and verse 37. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. The desire of women. Interesting clause. It can also be translated, he will not be concerned with the desire of women. And the German Schlachter Bible commentary, to my surprise, said this could mean that he is homosexual. Now, I had concluded that in reading this passage that that was a possibility, but I was quite surprised when I read this commentary pointing out exactly the same thing. So you have already several characteristics now. You have a characteristic that this is a man who had received a deadly wound. He might very well be homosexual. And, well, there is more. There is more about this person. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 13 and in verse 7. It was granted to him, talking about this individual, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. He was making war with the saints. Now that's important, this word with. Because if you look at a parallel passage in Daniel 7, there it's slightly differently worded. Daniel 7 and verse 21. I was watching, and the same horn, that little horn, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. There, the saints were victims, and they were being persecuted, and war was made against them, and they tolerated it. They didn't resort to violence. They didn't fight back. This is not what's being stated here. Let's go back to Revelation 13 and verse 7. Let's read it again. It was granted to him to make war with the saints. A war between two parties is being described here. And then it goes on to say, verse 9, if anyone has an ear, is an ear, let him hear. Verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Now, why is this being stated here? I mean, Christ said to Peter, when he was taking the sword to defend him, put it away. Because everyone who takes it will perish by it. This is now a warning to the Laodicea church, the Laodiceans. You want to take the sword to defend yourself? You'll be killed with a sword. And ultimately, it could be the sword of Christ. You'll be killed by his word. Because he goes on to say, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That's what's required. The faith not to have to fight back, not wanting to fight back. The patience waiting for God that he will intervene. 
Now, why is this so critically important here? For numerous reasons. You go through church history. And you, again, you might want to look at our booklet again on the book of Revelation, where we talk about all the seven errors of the church. And in several places, you had a certain error, and it was fine until then the particular leader might have died. And then suddenly this peaceful church became a warrior group, literally fighting in war. Several times that happened. The politicians, for instance, were known suddenly as a warrior sect because they were so fierce in the way they fought. There was another era where that also happened. When Mr. Armstrong died and the new leadership took over, one of the first things they started debating and then talked about it is a true Christian got to fight in war, in certain wars, in holy, righteous wars. The best example they always gave was the American Christian had to fight in World War II against the evil forces of Nazism in Germany. And when I asked one of these guys, I said, well, now, let's wait a minute. So in other words, here you have an American Christian, and he is flying over there to Germany, and he's dropping the bomb over, let's say, the city of Dresden, which was totally obliterated, as you know. And in doing that, I don't know how many true Christians were living in that city, and they would all be killed by that bomb. And this American Christian is responsible for that. So how do you answer that? Well, these are the casualties of war, was the answer. And then, more and more, the teaching became, you have to fight in war, in certain wars. Do you see here that a warning is being given? That this is exactly what's going to happen? As time progresses, that many Laodiceans will ultimately go to war, take the sword, kill others. The warning is, if you do that, Christ says, you are going to be in big trouble. There is one church organization I know of claiming to be in the body of Christ. And I've read their letter, I don't know how many years ago, already, saying to their members, there are times where you have to take up a weapon and fight in war. In the letter. Don't think that this won't happen again. We have always said in the church, there are three components. It's kind of a development, an avalanche. It starts here, it goes to the next step, it goes to the third and final step. The first one always has been voting in governmental elections. You start doing that, your way towards fighting a war is not far. Why is that so? the case? Well, because you see, you are voting for somebody, specifically here in the United States, who is the chief commander of the army who has all the rights, the executive powers, to go to war. You vote for a person like that. The next one then goes hand in hand with it, serving on the jury. Because now you are getting even more and more involved in the system of this world. And you are judging others, casting judgment on others, being part of this whole system. And that leads you to the third one, joining the military. Or being drawn into the military in a combatant capacity. And then there is war. And then you'll fight in war. Because after all, if I don't do that, I mean, I'll be shot. So I have to do that, right? Because your conscience has already been so much seared. Your, your attitude towards this whole situation has become so lackadaisical, so permissive, that when that time comes, Many will fail the task. Notice Revelation chapter 17, because notice where it can lead to. Ultimately, because then you will also be deceived, following this military leader, thinking, oh, he's such a great guy. Revelation 17 and verse 12. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received the kingdom as yet, have, no, have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour, very short time, as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and their authority to the beast. 
And these will make war with the Lamb. That's how far it's going to go. They will be trying to fight Jesus Christ when he returns, being so deceived that they don't even recognize him anymore, thinking perhaps he is the Antichrist, because after all, doesn't Jesus Christ, called the men of perdition, but they say, oh, it's Jesus Christ. He's going to sit already in the temple of God, claiming to be God, so therefore, whoever is coming now couldn't be the Son of God. That's how far it can go. If you're not careful with how it starts. And again, Revelation 19 and verse 19. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And that final war, if you can call it such, is described in the book of Zechariah. 14th chapter, and you see what's going to happen to those armies trying to fight Christ. Let's look at the contrast now. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. Revelation 14 and verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name, of course we are talking about before they are being killed. I mean, they're not alive then and in hell or whatever, you know, so it's talking about the time. They have no rest day and night as long as they are alive. Those who are worshiping the beast and the image, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. That's what's required. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the, faith, and the faith of Jesus. Now here, the keeping is most certainly not just knowing it theoretically because they have gone through this ordeal, but the contrast is what's even emphasized here. Because you see, they keep and have God's commandments. They are not adopting the commandments of that beast power. And it says they have the faith of Jesus, and they do not worship the beast and the false prophet, as the previous verse says. That's a contrast here. But they have this privilege because they have come to the point where they are not becoming so deceived that they are willing to follow that man, that evil man. In Revelation chapter 16, this is talking about the time ahead of us, just prior to Christ's return. Even there, you read something interesting, Revelation 16 and verse 12. And then the sixth angel poured out the bowls on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, and so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So the beast and the false prophet both will be under the influence, under the possession of demons. Verse 14, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. See, they are being together at Armageddon to then move towards Jerusalem. Now, why would Christ go on to say the next verse? Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keep his garments, lest he walk naked. And they see his shame, exactly what he said earlier to the Laodiceans. The Laodiceans will be challenged here not to participate in this war which is going to come, which ultimately will be a war against Jesus Christ. Because what do we read in verse 16? And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. That's where they're going to meet. By that time, the propaganda machine will be so big, so great. You're talking about a propaganda machine today when it comes to the coronavirus. Nothing in comparison to what's going to happen. And people are willing to buy everything they hear today. How much more are they going to be 
willing to buy everything they are being told, especially in the Laodicea church, and the church is not limited to just one organization, with people who have the Laodicean spirits. They are rich, self-satisfied, have need of nothing. Well, I'm supposed to listen to this minister? Oh, I don't know all the truths. I, I mean, I know all the truths myself. I don't have to listen. Revelation 18, verse 4. Another warning. Revelation 18 and verse 4. It's talking in the context of the fall of Babylon, the modern Babylon. And just prior to this, here is, if you please, another last warning. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Come out of that political system. Don't think that you have to participate in this political system in any way. Don't think you can do this and still have the Philadelphia spirit. It's not possible. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she has rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix for her double. Verse 8. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned or burned up. Here it says one day. But if you keep reading in verse 10, here it says, The king stands at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour judgment has come. And again, verse 17, in one hour. Also in verse 19, for in one hour she is made desolate. And notice those ten kings will receive power together with the beast, for one hour. All of this goes together. It's a very same time period, and it's short. Could be three and a half years, and the Great Tribulation starts. Could be a little bit longer. It may take a little bit for the beast to establish himself, but not much. Could be even shorter, because Christ said that he is going to come to shorten those days. If he wouldn't come to shorten those days, then no flesh would be saved alive. The beast power is forming right now. Let's not, let's not make any mistake. It is forming right now in Europe. The coronavirus, what we're experiencing right now, is a preview. Definitely a preview of what is going to happen. Totalitarian measures are being inflicted upon the people on the whole earth. A preview, perhaps. Think of the Third Reich and think of East Germany at the time before the wall fell. Think of China. Think of Russia. Think of all these dictatorships, people living there without freedom. That is what we can expect to happen in our country, around the world. God tells us we must obey God rather than man. The time will come where we all will be challenged. Are we willing to obey the laws of the land if they are in conflict with the laws of God? And of course, you need to know what the laws of God are. I mean, God told the apostles, preach the gospel. They did. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. They were released. They went right back into the temple to preach. They were brought back. Well, didn't we tell you? You're not supposed to preach. Peter said, well, we have to obey God rather than man. You can only come to that approach if you have and maintain and keep the Philadelphia spirit. If you don't have it, if you get to the point where you say, oh, I have to serve on the jury because, you know, I cannot get excused. I won't even have to try. As some people have told me, you have already lost the battle. You have already lost the battle. We must be zealous. We must remain zealous for the truth no matter what the consequences may be, may have to be. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to go back to the very beginning of my Bible study. 
This was written, what I'm going to read to you now, long time ago. Long time ago. But I think it's more relevant than it has ever been. I actually have two rather lengthy articles. One is entitled, A True History of the True Church. Those of you who are and have been in the church for a long, long time might recall this article. It was written in 1959. 1959. I'd like to just read to you from the very last page. A true history of the true church. Now notice Jesus' last warning to his church. At the very close of this age, when the work of spreading the gospel is almost finished, Jesus addressed yet another church work, the church at Laodicea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This frightful condition lies now ahead of us. Just as the remains of the Sardis era of the church exist side by side with the Philadelphia era, I remember when it was written, so we will continue our work to the very end time when another group will appear, a group not accounted worthy to escape the coming tribulation. Another separate work is yet to arise, made up of begotten individuals who are spiritually lukewarm. Woe be to any of us if we take part in such a work. Here is a work yet to arise because of our preaching, which will say, I am rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. And Jesus will reply, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It is time to wake up. If you become complacent, lacking in zeal, looking upon a local church as a social club, instead of having your heart in the gospel, you too may find yourself in the church of Laodicea, left to suffer the impending, horrifying tribulation. Notice Jesus' admonition for today in Luke 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all the things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Let us all pray and work together to carry this gospel to all nations so Jesus will say to each of us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That was one article. But here I have another collection, big collection. It's the old Ambassador College Bible Correspondence Course. And I have here put together lessons 49 to 53. This goes through the entire history of the church. There's a lot of interesting information. I might even use the time later on to go through it in more detail. Right now, I'd like to just read to you portions from what is being said about the Laodicean church. Matthew 25 indicates that some of the end time foolish virgins will not yet be ready when Christ arrives. The name Laodicea is Greek. It means the self-righteous people. It is significant that the ancient city of Laodicea lies a great ruin today. Then the question is asked, why will the Laodiceans find themselves in such a pitiable state? Here's the answer. They will have been self-deceived. They know not that they themselves are the ones pitiable and beggarly and blind and naked. They thought they had made proper preparation for the return of Christ, they will say, I have become rich, physically and spiritually, and have need of nothing. The ancient city of Laodicea was famous for its money transactions and its soft wool. Laodicea was almost a synonym for soft, luxurious living. Not far from the city was a pagan temple with a great medical school. Naturally, Laodicea produced some famous skeptic philosophers. The modern Laodiceans, the modern 
Laodiceans, will be products of this modern age of skepticism, unbelief, creature comforts, medicine, and permissiveness. They are too close to the ways and false gods of this world to get really sugar up about God's truth until finally shaken out of their lukewarmness by having to suffer in the Great Tribulation. The Laodiceans actually have been begotten of God's Spirit. Their lambs are lit, but are going out because the supply of oil, the Holy Spirit, has not been continually replenished and increased. And then in conclusion, in conclusion of this article and in conclusion of the Bible study today, it says, the greatest time of trouble ever is soon to occur on this earth. And unless God cuts these hellish days short for the sake of his elect, there would no flesh be saved alive. Except for the presence and prayers of God's people. Let me repeat this. Except for the presence and prayers of God's people, this present evil world would experience utter destruction. We need to realize just how important it is for each of us to personally overcome and plunge wholeheartedly into God's present work. At the time of the flood, only righteous Noah and his family escaped utter destruction. In the destruction of Sodom, only Lot and his two daughters escaped. How much of this present world's population survives the coming Holocaust and lives on into the world tomorrow depends a great deal on the effectiveness of this present work in reaching the world with the good news of God's coming kingdom and on the number converted during this age who will be available to teach and serve those who survive. We have only a very short time left, now more than ever. Think how much depends on you. Thank you.